<laughs> so hello and welcome to Advances and Emergent Needs in Paleo Geoscience Cyber Infrastructure, a webinar series organized by C4P. C4P, Collaboration and Cyber Infrastructure in Paleo Geosciences, is an EarthCube research coordination network supported by the National Science Foundation. I am Megan Carter. I will be the moderator today and also running the WebEx in place of Leslie. In today's talk, we have two presentations, each 20 minutes with roughly 10 minutes for questions. We want to keep it to an hour, so I'll be fairly strict about enforcing time limits and we'll give each speaker a three minute warning. If you have questions, please send them through the WebEx chat window and I will read them aloud after the presentation. You may send in a question at any time. All presentations and follow-up discussion will be publicly archived on the EarthCube website and at the C4P YouTube channel at youtube.com slash cyber4paleo. Our first speaker today is Marshall Ma from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and he'll be talking about a golden spike information portal enabled by semantic technologies and data. Our second speaker is Jack Williams from the University of Wisconsin, who will be telling us about age models, chronologies, and databases. We'll begin with Marshall Ma. I'll pass you the share screen. Please click on the pop-up window and begin when you're ready. Thank you, Megan. Um, I think you can see my desktop now. Yes. Good. Yep. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is um, Marshall Ma. Uh, I'm currently a research associate at um, Titanus World Constellation at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Um, originally, I did my PhD of Earth System Science um, in University of Twente at Enschede. Um, in, it's in the Netherlands. So today I'm going to talk about um, a part of my recent work is on a portal, an information portal for the golden spikes. So let me start with some, um, some background information of this talk. So I think I, I want to put this talk in the background of uh, e-science and uh, geoinformatics. So e-science is like to use the digital or um, electronic um, facilities to promote um, what kinds of science works. And then the geoinformatics works, I think is a part of the e-science, is to uh, use um, the state-of-the-art information technologies to promote um, uh, geoscience research. So um, we're going to talk about Golden Spike Information Portal. So here I want to first introduce some um, interesting background story of Golden Spike. So actually, um, uh, the golden spike in geology um, comes from a true golden spike. I think um, it's um, related to um, Leland uh, Stanford. Uh, yeah, he's uh, the founder of the Stanford University. And uh, the word golden spike comes from the, the true spike they use um, for the first transcontinental railroad across the United States. So here you can see a, pen, uh, a painting. And uh, also, even the original, uh, yeah, it's true golden spike. So it's a true golden spike. It's made of gold. Um, but the original one um, is now in a museum at Stanford University. And uh, even the, um, the quarter for the uh, Utah State, they use the golden spike on the, on the Utah quarter. I've been in the United States for two years, but um, I always try to find a Utah quarter, but uh, I didn't get one yet. So <laughs> that's another story. Um, so we're going to talk about the golden spike in geology. So um, I want to first give some information about geological time, because um, I think not everyone here is a um, geologist. Maybe some of them are working on computer science. So the geological time, I think, is um, um, I think it was a time span from the beginning of the history of the Earth to present. So we know the Earth has a long history. It begins around 
uh, 4.6 billion years ago. So we can see the geological time is really a long period. And then the geological time scale is um, people use it as a timeline, as a timeline framework for studying the history of the Earth. And then the golden spike in geology actually is um, the elite claim for the GSSP. The forename is uh, Global Boundary Strato Type Section and uh, Point. And here you can see in these two photos, actually they are the golden spike for a period in the geological time scale, the Eddy current period. And uh, the physical location of this golden spike is in South Australia. And then the definition of uh, golden spikes uh, is um, coordinated by the International Commission on Stratigraphy. Um, the actual work uh, began in 1977, and by the middle of this year, uh, we have we have around 65 of the 101 stages because uh, in in the people's plan, um, they want to have around 101 uh, golden spikes in the geological time scale, and so far. 65 of the golden spikes, they are formally uh, defined and ratified by the International Union of uh, Geological Science. So we can see um, the golden spike, they are very closely related to uh, the study of uh, rock layers, the stratigraphy, and uh, fossils, paleontology. So let's take a golden spike in the United States, for example, the Taronia. So we can see it's in the um, uh, period of Cretaceous, and then the physical location is in um, Colorado in the United States. Actually, for this one, it's very interesting. It's very close to a railroad, the physical location of this um, uh, golden spike. And we can see uh, geologists, they made very detailed, very precise description about the background and about the fossils related to the golden spike, and uh, they are uh, formal journal papers, publications, academic publications about the golden spike, how people ratify this place as a golden spike for a certain um, period, for, for a certain stage in the geological time scale. And that detailed uh, evidence of fossils, like this, I show here. So, um, the point I want to express here is that um, the GSSP, the golden spike information, is valuable to um, the study of stratigraphy, paleontology, and also other disciplines. And some do some of these documents, they are already uh, made open, open access and on the web, like the images, the papers, and, and also the, the photos. I showed here, they are already made open access online, so they are free to access. But why I want to um, develop such a, a golden spike information portal? And I think the idea here is um, I want to show the advantage of uh, the semantic web. Because in the semantic web, we use the concept of web of data. We regard the traditional web as a web of documents. So we want to um, organize the information on the web, the available information on the web into a machine-readable format. So we want to transform the documents into data and link them together. And, and then we can use some semantic technologies to chain up uh, this information, data, and documents. And also, I want to uh, use some uh, data visualization technologies to uh, build a friendly user interface. I think that, that part is of interest to geologists. They want a, a friendly user interface of the information portal. So um, the method I used for developing the portal, I already mentioned a little bit. So the first is uh, some semantic modeling and encoding work that's related to a geological time ontology and uh, a vocabulary. I will give more details on that one. And then the second part is data visualization, I already mentioned. And then uh, the third part is some uh, spiral query because we um, built a geological time ontology and also a geological time vocabulary. And then we set up a triple store. 
and then we use the Sparkle query to use the triple store we built. And um, in this information portal, I also try to uh, retrieve the um, online web players provided in the form of um, WMS, web map service. They are provided by uh, geological survey agencies. I think some of them, they are national uh, geological service. Some of them, they are state geological service. And I put the online map players together um, with the Golden Spike information in my information portal. Later, I will show more details. So uh, first, I want to introduce how, how do we um, model and um, encode the geological time scale into an ontology and a vocabulary. I think there are two key concepts in the geological time. I think actually uh, those two key concepts, instant and interval, they are also applicable to the model from the general time. So the instant is like a particular point in time and the interval is the period of time. So like here, if we look at uh, the example of Jurassic, so we can see Jurassic is the period of um, time. And then the start time and the end time of um, Jurassic, there are two uh, instants. So that's uh, the concept we used in the modeling. And also um, for the geological time scale, I think um, it has a very specific structure. If we look at the whole geological uh, time scale, we call it, um, so if you look uh, top down or bottom up, is um, an ordinal structure. If we look at those concepts at the, the same level, like if we um, look at the stage, so uh, fr from the stages in upper Jurassic to the stages in the lower Jurassic, they are they are at a sequential um, um, pattern, so they are ordinal. But if you look uh, from Mesozoic to Jurassic to upper, middle, and lower Jurassic, and also to those stages, they are in a hierarchical structure. So we see the geological time scale, um, those concepts in geological time scale, they are organized in an ordinal hierarchical structure. And we also uh, encode this structure in, into the vocabulary. So I think here, um, this is a very classical um, um, diagram. Um, the, author, the authors are uh, Simon Cox and uh, Steve Richard. Uh, Simon is from CESRO in Australia, and uh, Steve is from uh, Arizona Geological Survey. Um, you can see in their diagram, they also show um, those two uh, concepts as I just introduced. Actually, I I propose these two uh, concepts, the interval and um, instant. Actually, they are generalized from this diagram. So you can see some similar concepts here. The time ordinal era represents the concept of um, interval. And the time ordinal era boundary represents the concept of um, instant. And then, uh, this diagram is very new, and I think Sam and uh, uh, Steve, they draw this uh, diagram this year. This is a um, paper in press. It's a diagram, it's a conceptual structure about um, the geological time ontology. So here you can also see the two core concepts, the geochronological era. I think this um, is the concept for the interval, and the geochronological boundary. This is the concept for the instant. And there are some other associated concepts to detail the conceptualization. And then we have the conceptual model and then how we encode the whole geological time scale into a vocabulary in a machine uh, readable format. So we use the geological time scale ontology we just introduced in this diagram and uh, the SCOS. SCOS is a W3C uh, recommendation. It's um, specifically defined for uh, encoding uh, vocabularies. So we use the geologic time scale ontology and the SCOS as a basic framework. And then we create concepts in the international stratigraphic charts as instances in a vocabulary. Uh, so I worked together with uh, Sam and Steve in the past few years and uh, the output vocabulary 
we have um, vocabularies for the international stratigraphic chart from first in 2004 to 2014. Um, for some years in the between, uh, we don't have um, international stratigraphic chart. So actually, I think there are around seven or eight vocabularies. If you go to this URL, you can find a list of those vocabularies. Um, in the coming few slides, I will use um, the ISC 2014, the latest version of the vocabulary, to introduce the features in the encoding. So here, um, I just copy a number of the triples. So sorry for the geologists. Um, this is a little bit computer science. Um, so here, the format we see um, is um, in a semantic web uh, format. We call them um, serialized in the turtle format. So triples is uh, subject, predict, and uh, object. Um, they are used for encoding the vocabulary here. So here I just copy a number of the um, triples. They are used uh, for encoding the temporal position of the base of Jurassic. So you can see we, we begin from ISC Jurassic, and then we can see it began uh, from the base of Jurassic. Uh, okay, we come to base Jurassic. Base Jurassic has a term proposition, base Jurassic time. And then we come to the base Jurassic time. It has a value, a numerical value. So you can see lumber here. And also the base of Jurassic time also has an, an, an uncertainty. So it's either, uh, it's either um, 0 0.2 uh, plus or 0 0.2 minus. So this is about the encoding of the uh, temporal position of the base of Jurassic. And uh, um, there's an interesting feature here. You can see um, Jurassic begin, the concept name here is base Jurassic, and then Jurassic end at the base of Cretaceous. Because when Jurassic ends, Cretaceous begins. So this is the feature of the encoding. And um, in this slide, you can see some triples uh, encoding the location of Jurassic in the hierarchy of the geological time scale. So we can see Jurassic has a broader concept. So you can see you can see here we use uh, scores, some some properties from scores. So Jurassic has a broader concept, Mesozoic. That means uh, Mesozoic is is at a higher level than Jurassic, and then Jurassic has three. Lateral concepts, there's the lower Jurassic, middle, and the upper Jurassic. And we can also see the um, definition of Mesozoic. So Mesozoic also has a broader uh, concept, it's um, Phanozoic. And also Mesozoic has three lateral um, concepts. You can see here Cretaceous Jurassic and uh, Jurassic. So in this way, we can see the location of Jurassic in the in the in the hierarchy of the geological time scale, um, and also okay, and uh, here is um, you can see some um, triples um, encoding the geographic location, the geographic location of um, um, the GSSP of the base of Jurassic. So we begin with base Jurassic. It has a strato type uh, GSSP base Jurassic. And then we come to the GSSP base Jurassic. Um, you, you can see another triple points to base Jurassic location. Okay, we'll come to the base Jurassic location. And then you come to um, a base Jurassic position. And then when we come to the base Jurassic position, we can see the two uh, coordinates. I think here is um, a geographic coordinates because we can see the SRS, the spatial reference system. This, I think this number, uh, 4326, uh, means this is the uh, geographic coordinates. Use the longitude and the uh, latitude. Marshall, okay. this is a three minute warning. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, so we introduced a lot about um, the modeling and the encoding. Uh, let's come to some uh, colorful results. So, we use uh, the D3 library to visualize the vocabulary. Uh, the data used in this uh, uh, visualization is a JSON document generated from the IOC 2012 vocabulary. Um, that's, a, that's a little bit older version. 
but now we are working on a new version. And we developed some uh, in interactive functions, like here you can see a mouse over, and you can see some uh, feedbacks from the from the visualization. Uh, and then we use a Sparkle query to get some results from, from the triple store. We set up a triple store with the developer of a query, and then we can use a Sparkle query to retrieve some information and then show them um, on the user interface. Like here, we use the Google Map API to show the location of each golden spike in, in the Google Map window. And then we can also uh, use Sparkle query to retrieve the information of each golden spike from the triple store, and then uh, associate this information with the golden spike symbol in the map window by using a small pop-up window. And then here is, here is some intelligent work uh, because we encode the um, ordinal hierarchical information in the in the vocabulary, and then we can also use uh, uh, Sparkle query to do some inference. Like here, we can see Jurassic, no Jurassic, and uh, the tangent. The three of them they share a same lower boundary. They share a same um, golden spike, and then when you click this. Uh, um, uh, buttons in the visualization, you can you can see in the map window um, a same golden spike. So in in this functionality, we use the Sparkle query, and then we also uh, reuse the web map service to um, retrieve um, more background geological information about the sur surrounding area of uh, a golden spike. So. The technical part is very simple. We just load a WMS layer into the Google Map window. And then we, we do the matchup. So we put uh, the triple store, the visualization, and then the Google Map window together. And then we set up the uh, information portal. So I put the URL here. You can go there and, um, and see the demo by yourself. So a short summary. Um, about the vocabulary work, I think the creation, uh, curation, and the application of vocabulary, they are from the community, by the community, and for the community. Um, for the International Stratigraphic Chart Vocabulary, we, uh, Simon, Steve, and me, we, we, in the past few years, we had a very close um, collaboration with people in the international. Commission on Stratigraphy. So when they have a new version of the of the International Stratigraphic Chart, we develop a new vocabulary. And then uh, for e-science and especially uh, geoinformatics, I think um, it's a collaboration between geologists and uh, computer scientists. But the goal is to send the right information to the right people in the right way. So when we use semantic technologies and uh, data, data visualization, we also need to communicate with um, the domain scientists. In this work, is the geologists, um, and then ask them. Um, there's some back and forth communication, and the goal is to make the information portal user friendly. And um, we are currently working on a new portal with um, the um, latest version of the vocabulary, and also with some new functionalities. Um, I want to thank a few um, um, uh, collaborators in this work. So um, for the vocabulary, I think I need to thank um, uh, Simon and Steve. And for the demo, we have some collaborators from uh, Rensselaer. And for the user uh, feedback, I, yeah, I need to thank a lot of people. Um, yeah, this is my final slide. I put a number of uh, papers here. And I think they are all related to this work. Um, you can, you, if you want to see more details, you can, you can go to these papers. And also, you are welcome to send me uh, emails uh, for more details. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marshall, for that very informative talk. Um, I just want to remind everyone that if you do have a question, now would be a time to type it in the chat window. Okay, so we have a question here, Marshall. Yep. Um, is showing or visualizing the uncertainty associated with the golden spike reference points part of your system or something you are planning to do? Um, yeah, 
so currently, um, let me see. Uh, in the visualization, we we did not show the uncertainty, but um, we use the visualization as um, as an entrance to retrieve more details from the triple store. In the vocabulary, we we did encode the uncertainty. But the current the current visualization only show um the relationship among I mean the current uh, the current visualization only show the ordinal hierarchical structure of the golden spike, but did not visualize the uncertainty. Okay, thank you, Marshall. We have another question here. Can you retrieve the original publication or other authority? Uh, yes, yes. Actually, um, I already have an um, initial version of um, of a new portal. Uh, in that one, I can um, retrieve, because for each golden spike, there's a formal journal paper describing the background information and the procedure, how this uh, golden spike is um, uh, ratified. Um, and uh, for each golden spike, there's a URL point pointing to a journal paper. Uh, so in my latest information portal, I can also show the URL to that paper in the pop-up window associated with uh, each uh, golden spike symbol in the map window. So I can do that. Okay, great. Well, if there are no further questions, then thank you very much again, Marshall. And I will now pass the presentation to Jack. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? And can you see my desktop? Yes, looks great. Okay, great. So, um, hello, and uh, could have a chance to speak with everybody. This is, what I'm really doing here is, is summarizing uh, a couple things. One is, that's probably the most important thing, is a workshop held in, that was held in Belfast back in the beginning of this year that was led by Eric Grimm and others. And from that, a workshop report has come out and will be published in the pages. Newsletter hasn't come out yet, so I'm giving you sort of a sneak preview of that. And um, kind of a simple four-part structure today, just a quick motivation, maybe a necessary for this group, about why, about why time is so important. Uh, then talk about how we store time in, 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 in age models in Neotoma. Talk about some of the current challenges in these quote informatics, and then some of the recommendations that came out of the Belfast workshop. So, you know, the, the, our data in its, in its you know, raw form is usually something like this different cores or digs or um, sections taken from exposures. And then the, the sort of these are mostly paleobiological databases that we're thinking about here, but of course other sorts of geological or geochemical measurements can be taken from these contexts. And then we measure some property varying over time. In this case, what you know, the diagram here is showing the abundances of different plant taxa based on fossil pollen occurrences. For, this is from a lake in, in Ohio from about 8,000 to about 16,000 years ago. And so there's been lots of great work, of course, done with these, with these site level studies, but to move beyond the site level scale to move to looking at continental to global scale patterns of ecological dynamics and climate change and climate driven ecological dynamics, et cetera, et cetera, really requires sort of two fundamental things. One is the databases and, and capacity to store this information, making it as much as possible easily retrievable. And then also, secondly, um, um, chronologies and age models, and critically, another point to add to what's on the slide there is not just having that information stored, but having that information, those chronologies and age models getting updated. And, that, and, I, and that's one of the sort of the major informatics challenges that I'll talk more about in the second half of the talk today. How do we, as we store these age models in databases, and as our as we can refine these age models, how do we keep our our, our databases current? Um, and as up-to-date as possible. So 
one one to sample a quick application of how um, you accurate dating is, is essential for ecological and geological inference. This is a snapshot from the Neotoma um, Explorer interface, pulling out data from the Neotoma database. The Neotoma holds mostly records in the last five million years, uh, and uh, it's a global database. And what we're looking at here is uh, the red dots are sites with occurrences of spruce, that's Picea, and specifically spruce pollen in excess of 40%. So that's some mapping of where spruce trees were and royal forests were between about 18 and 12,000 years ago. And then the green dots map out the occurrences of mastodon, baboots, and where mastodon was. And mastodon is a browser, it eats uh, you know, uh, woody plants. And so you can see there's a strong co-occurrence here that where Picea is found, or where, where, where uh, mastodon tends to be found in places with Picea and other tree taxa. This sort of mapping and co-occurrence analyses requires um, having confidence in the radiocarbon dates or other age controls being used um, to place these samples in, in, in time. So to move that to some terminology and some ways that we've uh, you know, conceptualized uh, building these these age models and, and chronologies. First is the idea of of, of of age controls. Some points that you have some absolute age estimate. Um, hopefully, with some uncertainty around that age estimate, and um, and so examples could be OSL dates or radiocarbon dates or other radiometric dates. And then you then set a model to that those dates. So the the, the circled points or the age controls, and then the age model is the red line. This case is a very simple age model, simply connecting the dots uh, between between the, the age controls, and then you use you use the age model to make inferences about age for intervals that aren't that are between your 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 age controls. And of course, once you there's many ways you could fit an age model, or many kinds of age models you could fit to a single set of age controls. You might make decisions about some age controls being uh, being not. Use if you have reason to suspect that a particular age control is a bad date, you know, contaminated or other other issues with that date, and so the analysts can make decisions about what age controls to use for a particular age model, and then what how to fit the model, what kind of model to fit to those age controls, and so a given site can and often does have more than one age model associated with it, and each of those age models has some set of age controls associated with it, plus an algorithm for making this this interpolation. And then another piece of terminology that we use when we're working with Neotoma is, in addition to age controls and age models, we also talk about chronology, which is really then the age is that are then inferred for um, particular depths. And so at right there, you can see sort of two columns. This would be depths in centimeters and some lake sediment core. And then the right is the age inferences for those depths. And um, often when, you know, one of the, one, one sort of informatics challenge that's out there is, Often, when data gets reported in the um, the literature or when it gets archived in some repositories, that's what you get. You get the depth information and the age estimate for that depth, but you don't necessarily have the information that tells you how those age estimates were generated. Um, the information about the chronic controls may be incomplete. Often, those the chronic controls are reasonably well documented in the primary literature, but often the age models, the, the, inter the interpolation used to between the age the controls is very poorly documented or incompletely documented and difficult to reproduce by a third party. Um, so moving then to how we store the sort of information in, in the Diatoma database, uh, we we have some terminology around collection units. So what we're looking at here are some table, table structures or relational diagrams among those table structures. So one table inside Diatoma is collection units, so that could be a core or a section taken from an outcrop, um, and then each collection unit can have one or more chronologies associated with it, and the chronologies has information about the age models used to generate that particular chronology, and then it also has a list of all the cron controls, which is a separate table. So each collection unit has one or more chronologies, each chronology has one or more cron controls. And then 
in terms of cron controls, there's a lot of uh, different kinds of cron controls out there, of course, different kinds of radiometric dates or other forms of, forms of information. So there's a whole set of tables around this information, and there's a, there's a, a nested hierarchy here in which there's a hierarchical classification of, what, of different kinds of cron controls. So the highest level, geochronological or radiometric, versus relative time scales, versus stratigraphic, versus other kinds of dating methods. Within geochronological dates, these are some of the different kinds of uh, radiometric or other um, uh, approaches used. And then within radiocarbon, depending, there could be other subcategories of this. So a radiocarbon date that is actually, in fact, the average of two dates that were collected, a radiocarbon date with a reservoir correction applied, a radiocarbon date that's been calibrated to calendar years, et cetera, et cetera. So the relative time scale, there's different categories. So we could look at marine isotopic stages or magnetic, the magnetic time scale, uh, the geological time scale, which we saw in the previous talk, uh, the North American archaeological time scale, and of course, many different parts, many different parts of the world have developed their own relative time scales. So this is allows uh, this hierarchical structure allows different time scales to be developed or uh, entered for different regions. Okay, there's 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 one just for the the last the, the Pleistocene and, and Holocene. Okay. So that's just a kind of a quick overview of, of some of the ways that we kind of conceptualize and store. And, and again, a, a general point there is that we view the, 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 the cron controls as fixed, essentially. They're not going to change over time. They are a measurement that were taken, and there's uncertainty around that estimate, but there's no reason to change that once that goes in. The age models are changing all the time, and so um, that's where new age models get generated, and we need to store these new rounds of age models as new age models get generated. And then one of the and then the chronologies, chronologies that are directly linked to the age models. One of the challenges that we run into is is that you know when a paper is published, the chronology of that that an age model of that paper at the time it is published is state of the art or hopefully state of the art, but five years, ten years go by and new uh, approaches come up and that model is age model that was developed at the time is necessarily no longer the, what would be the latest and greatest age model if you were to rebuild it. And so one issue is that there's the well-known discrepancy between ages, uh, radiocarbon ages, as directly inferred from radiocarbon dating, and then the true calendar age, the actual age of materials of when the, when the, material, when the, when the uh, organism died. And there is an effort, the it, it, it Cal, the International Calibration Effort, which is always working on new and improved calibration curves to relate radiocarbon years to true calendar years. And every few years, those calibration curves get republished and updated, and that instantly throws, means that any prior radiocarbon-based chronology is now obsolete because the, there's a new calibration curve out there. And you can see how, looking at this, this plot here, it's comparing INCAL 09 and INCAL 13, and you can see how for, let's say, the last 15,000, most recent 15,000 years, they're basically right on top of each other. There's essentially little or no difference between the two, but you move back to 15 to 50,000 years ago, and there's some fairly substantive differences between the two, and age models covering that time period would need to be revised and updated. Oops, I meant to have this, this, this parameter file pop up in a second, but uh, so sorry about that, but the second point here is that the, the so not only do our controls in some ways or our interpretation or calibration of the controls change over time, but of course we're always building new and better software packages and algorithms for building better age estimates. One of the major changes that's, that the field has been going through over the last five years or so, maybe a bit longer, is the switch from classical age models in which you literally regress between your controls or literally interpolate or connect the dots between your age controls to these Bayesian age models and some popular software packages are Bacon and Vcron and you can't quite see it, but the, so the output in the back there is, is Bacon output and you can start to see how we're starting to get this, some fairly complex models where you can see that there's, there, this, there's a sort of nonlinear, smoothly fit um, uh, interpolation among the uh, the, 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 the blue age controls, 
And then you can see how the uncertainty is being more modeled in a more sophisticated way in which the uncertainty basically narrows down when you're near the age controls and then balloons out when you're away from the age controls, something that the, the classical models, uh, age models wouldn't necessarily reproduce correctly or appropriately. Um, and so these new Bayesian age models have a lot of things going for them, and there, there's a reason why they're becoming increasingly widespread and popular. They then bring with them new metadata needs. And so the, the figure that's up front there that's kind of blocking the, the output in the back is just an example of the settings file for Bacon. And so if you were to actually reproduce a, a Bacon age model, you would need all that information in that settings file plus information about the original age controls that were used um, for the Bacon age model. And so this creates a new set of um, metadata challenges and what's critical to store, what, what are the best formats and ways of storing this data. And that was, this was sort of, this was one of the focal points of, of conversation um, at the Belfast workshop. So other points, other challenges, is this point I mentioned already, which is that if, if the goal is to take the author's original publication and then update it using the latest um, calibration curve or using a new and approved software package, often that starting point is actually the hardest one, which is get finding what the original age model was to begin with. Sometimes people say we did linear regression or we did you know, third order polynomial, but they won't provide the parameters used for that third order polynomial. Um, they will list Hopefully, they're radiocarbonates, but um, the standards vary there. And so this forces, quite often forces, when we were putting data and age models into Neotoma, for us to take our best guess and do our best to reproduce the age model that was used at the time of publication, but it's not an exact reproduction. And our age models, compared to the author's actual age model, would show some divergences in some way. And then there's this other question that goes beyond sort of the, the software and informatics side, which is the governance question, which is who creates these age models? And when we are showing data in the Atoma, we have made some decision about what is the preferred age model. There can be multiple age models for a site, but when, when, when users are searching, retrieving, querying data, say for Picea 12 to 14,000 years ago, we've made some determination about what the quote unquote best or default age model is. And so there's some question of who gets to make that decision, the database, the database manager, the original authors, who may or may not be you know, active anymore, uh, but you know, council of experts. So there's some questions about this sort of decision making and ensuring top quality and rigorously vetted um, uh, age information. So from this uh, workshop, and again, this workshop was held at the beginning of this year, uh, there's about 35 participants from about a dozen countries. Um, these are some of the recommendations that came from this workshop. And I bring this up partly because this, this, this research coordination network, we're about to hold a, a workshop in October. And I think the workshop we had in Belfast, although we were mostly focusing on, you know, the last five million years, radiocarbon as a particular type of age was, or age control was a major emphasis. But some of the points raised here, I think, would carry forward well to our next workshop. So some of the recommendations you can see here. One is this general point that the, the chronologies, the age models reported in the literature must be reproducible and and this and publication databases should store the data and metadata need to, needed to ensure reproducibility. And this is something that we can implement relatively easily within the databases as, as centralized repositories. Um, the broader challenge is getting the word out to journal editors and authors to uh, and just set some standards on what is um, uh, the, you know, storing the necessary metadata. This leads to point two, which is the recommendation that those who are developing age model software should uh, be creating, as one of their outputs, um, some easily stored and, um, age model definition files. Could be an XML format or other formats. And that there's a need to develop a common metadata standard for these files with the idea that, that they can be attached as say supplementary info to a journal publication, could be ingested into a database or, or uh, used in other ways. But the uh, starting point is agreement on a common metadata standard. Um, and third recommendation that whenever possible, we should be storing in our databases originally published chronologies as a, as a primary uh, point of reference. 
but <laughs> we can't do that unless that information is available. So, you know, doing the best we can. Um, point four is the point saying that it is okay to generate new agent models, that the original models that were developed for the original paper are important, but they shouldn't be held sacred. They have to be updated when new calibration curves get developed or new modeling approaches become available. And um, often, this, these new age models can be developed by the data, ma data managers themselves, or maybe even more frequently getting developed by third parties, teams such as, say, Pages 2K, which is a big effort to synthesize paleoclimatic data for the last 2,000 years. As they go through this, the rounds of data assemblage and collection and analysis, there's often an effort to update and revise the available age models, and so that's a good time to put those revised and updated age models back into the original repository. Jack, this is your three-minute warning. Oh, did somebody say something? Uh, this is your three-minute warning. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and um, the determination of what is our recommendation was that the determination of the preferred or default database phenologies can be made by the database managers, but should be subject to review by external advisory boards. And of course, if the original author isn't happy with whatever revised age model is to put in, their, their voice would carry a lot of weight. We could always put in a re re revised age model. One point that came up is this question of, you know, with these databases, it would be tempting to simply automate and generate a whole bunch of new age models. That is something to be very careful about because each site has its own idiosyncrasies and rarely does one size fit all when it comes to age modeling and, and applying these sorts of software approaches. So um, at, at the very minimum, if you're going to do something like that, make sure you look at them carefully before you put them into a database and pass them out for people to use. Also, this is a little bit more of a specific need within the Atoma, but we have well-developed meta metadata standards for radiocarbon. We need to extend our metadata standards for other kinds of dating techniques, luminescence dates, argon argon, et cetera, et cetera. And then another point that came up was a lot of the, you know, we're in some sense, you know, doing a lot of the work that could be done by the radiocarbon community itself. And it would be nice to have an open access database for radiocarbon dates. One of the challenges is that the radiocarbon laboratory, it's a company that's proprietary information. They have been paid money by an individual scientist or team to contribute the radiocarbon dates to the laboratory. And so they can't just release that information, you know, freely. So one of our recommendations was the creation of, a, of an open access database and that people who are buying radiocarbon dates from radiocarbon labs or other radiometric dating techniques um, should be encouraged to, to contribute their data to those, such a database upon publication or whatever appropriate. So again, just to thanks all for the time here. This was again based sort of summary of some conclusions from a workshop uh, back in January. This was supported by PAGES. PAGES is supported by the National Science Foundation and the Swiss Science Foundation. And, uh, and you know, lots of folks in Vietnam were at this among a broader representation from the community. And thanks all, and I'll take questions. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, once again, if anybody has any questions, please type them into the chat window. Right, Jack, everybody seems pretty quiet today. Um, clear as mud, or I put them all to sleep, either way. I thought it was very clear. <laughs> well, Amy Murbo is around the corner. I'm actually over at Minnesota sampling cores, and so you can't see the context here, but there's, there's racks and racks of sediment cores behind me, so it's, a, it's an appropriate setting for this talk. I see. All right, well, I would like to thank our presenters again today. Um, and remind you that this webinar will be available later, both at the EarthCube website and the C4P YouTube channel, Cyber for Paleo. For future webinars, please check the C4P webinar schedule at the earthcube.org website. Um, so thank everybody for being a part of this today. Great. Thank you.